The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. Hello, and welcome to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. Today's episode is episode number 184. When a person is addicted to drugs and or alcohol, the myriad of choices of treatment can be overwhelming. Narconon Ojai is a residential treatment facility that addresses the physical, mental, and spiritual aspects of addiction with a proven, evidence-based, step-by-step program designed to free those trapped by addiction. For more information, call 866-231-5924. That's 866-231-5924. Today we will be talking to a former NFL player known as Thomas Hollywood Henderson. The Dallas Cowboys selected Thomas Henderson out of Little Langston University in Oklahoma as the 18th pick in the first round of the 1975 NFL draft. In 1977, everything changed. Henderson started in 14 games. During that season, he evolved into a star linebacker. Henderson quickly drew, grew addicted to drugs and alcohol, and as is often the case for addicts, he disguised it well. In fact, he disguised it so well, he went on to have a Pro Bowl season in 1978, a season in which the Cowboys made a return trip to the Super Bowl to face the Pittsburgh Steelers, a Super Bowl in which Henderson was high on liquefied cocaine. The following season, as his addictions increased, his production on the field decreased. Henderson lasted one more season with the Cowboys and played two brief stints with the Houston Oilers and Miami Dolphins. Henderson's life spiraled out of control. In 1983, he hit rock bottom when he was accused of sexual assault. He pled no contest to the charges and in June 1984 reported to prison. It was the best thing that could have happened to him, in his words. In prison, Henderson had no choice but to sober up. He attended church, and he devoured books. In 1990, he returned to his hometown of Austin, Texas, where he created a project for himself, rebuild the dilapidated football field he had played on as a young child. Today, he splits his time between Texas and Florida, speaking in prisons, churches, AA meetings, and basically to anyone who might benefit from hearing his story. Without further ado, let's talk to Thomas Henderson. Thomas Henderson, thank you so much for being willing to be on the podcast today. I really appreciate your willingness to share your story. Thank you very much for having me. So the way I typically start is we know that you formerly had a problem with drugs and alcohol. How did that start for you? Did it start when you were already a football player or was it in your youth? Tell us how it started for you. It... um... It started in my home. Uh, My mother and father both uh, drank uh, alcohol um, as I was a kid growing up. Um, I really didn't uh, drink that much until I became a professional football player. I drank beer. If if it if it wasn't you know near freezing, I didn't couldn't stand it. One time as a child, uh, me and a buddy was in the back of my mom's car. She was at a happy hour or something. I must have been eight or nine years old. And we found a Mickey, which is, in the old days, that's a half pint of uh, of liquor. And it happened to be whiskey. And he and I drank the little Miss. It's a half pint. We drank it. I got drunk. I threw up. And so that experience initially with alcohol uh, was bad. And I just, you know, up and through my football career, I just didn't, I didn't drink wine and I didn't drink anything brown. (laughs) Um, You know, the cognacs, the whiskeys, the bourbons. I just, you know, everybody be doing their thing. And I say, you know, give me a beer. I'll have a beer just to, you know, got drunk once in college, uh, drinking uh, a Reba, you know, like a 19% alcohol on the campus. And 
I got very sick. And, and so I just um, I never locked in on alcohol until around 1982. Okay. And what led you to alcohol and the drugs while you were an NFL player? How did that occur? Well, you know, I'm sorry. My husband mentioned we interviewed Randy Grimes, and most of his history with drugs came about from using painkillers as an NFL player. So I'm trying to kind of compare that to what your experience was like. Well, I uh, I started, you know, matter of fact, okay, Super Bowl ten. Um, I'm in Miami, Florida. I meet uh, uh, one of the Pointer sisters. And then, you know, that off season, I went to Los Angeles and stayed about four months. And I met Richard Pryor. I met uh, Marvin Gaye. And they actually became very, very close friends of mine. So I, I started observing. So cocaine was... Um, widely used uh, in the mid 80s, well, in the 70s, I'm sorry. And of course, Marvin and Richard were no exception. And so I started to tinker with cocaine and I liked it. In other words, in the, in the theme of partying, having a good time, hanging with the boys, staying up until four o'clock in the morning, so, I kind of got into the cocaine. So I'm still not drinking. You know, I'm still just a, you know, snorting. And, and then um, in the 70s, again, I'm at Richard Pryor's house and uh, he's making this thing and he's putting it on this plate and, and it dries and takes a razor blade and sort of gets it all to the middle and um, it was um, not crack, it was a free base. Right. Using ether. And because I smoked, Richard screamed at the top of his voice at me several times while I'm smoking a cigarette. And he was telling me, no, oh, no, no, you blow this place up. And, and so, after Super Bowl X, hanging in Los Angeles, going to the Playboy Mansion with Hefner and Cosby and all of it, again, I'm still not drinking alcoholically. Um, I'm just sort of doing the cocaine game. So the first time I tried some of Richard's, Richard Pryor's cocaine was Freebase. I hated it. It had a, the ether was tasted awful. It was extremely flammable. And so for all those reasons that it didn't taste good, I got no feeling from it. I didn't do it. You know, what's the so, point? <laughs> what's the point? Yes. Okay. So that was after Super Bowl 10. And yes. then, and then what progressed from there? Well, I came back to Dallas and, um, and I just started getting these hookups for cocaine to go get a gram or two grams or an eight ball, which is three and a half grams. And, you know, was wearing the gold spoon around my neck. Uh, it was just what we were doing in the, in the 70s in Dallas. Um, um, and so it went, you know, I, I destroyed my nose. Um, I saw where you talked about that. And, you know, uh, one of the things I think sometimes people don't understand is the long-term physical detriment that can be caused by drugs. And you, you definitely had issues from snorting it. Yes, I did. I, I still have a hole in my septum uh, from the pure volume of this uh, Hoover <laughs> vacuum cleaner here. Um, and you've been sober for almost 37 years. Thank God. Yes. And, and I like it and I live it. 
But but I but the point I'm trying to make too here is I think so often, you know, especially with young people when they do drugs or they try drugs, I think you know, it's not going to affect me. It's not going to have any long-term effect. And I've watched documentaries of former drug addicts and, you know, losing pieces of their intestines and what have you. And here you are clean and sober for 37 years, and you still have some physical disability from doing the cocaine. So I, it's a bit of a scare tactic on my part, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, uh... It all, I think all of it goes back to the first time we steal a sip of daddy's beer or there's alcohol in the home or your 14 year old friend shares a, a little bit of uh, vodka with you or gin or anything. And for some of us, um, I think the initial trigger is just socializing. Um, you know, I don't know very many people who, you know, had their first drink and locked themselves in the closet for 20 years. It, it's really social. So growing up, I look back now, my mom and dad were both alcoholics. I didn't grow up with my real father, but come to find out he's an alcoholic and a drug addict. But I, all, I, I take it back to, if you never try any of it, you won't have to deal with any of it. Hmm. Uh, because from my perspective, the, the progression for me socially drinking or even socially doing drugs, you know, I went all through college smoking pot, uh, but not drinking because I just didn't have, you know, a taste for alcohol. But I did, you know, mushrooms and LSD and acid and smoke pot, uh, you know, uh, all day and forever. The worst pot in the world, by the way, that that stuff they call commercial. Oh, my God. I've, I still got holes. In, I got garments with holes in them from the seeds popping from back in the day. Uh, so, so Thomas Henderson... Um, I think what drove me more into the using and, and really into a deep, deep, deep addiction was my heart was broken. You know, I got fired by Tom Landry. And um, I just went to the dope house and loaded up and I started smoking crack cocaine like a maniac. Uh, and that, Excuse me, Thomas, but he, but you were fired partly because of your cocaine habit, no? Well, the behavior, yes. Okay, okay. You know, my, my performance and behavior were equal. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was a great player and I was a great addict. So uh, let's, <laughs> let's get that out there. Um, and, and so the, the, the Cowboys knew and on a really cold day, uh, one of the Cowboys executives uh, met me in a parking lot and said to me, uh, we know what you're doing. And they gave me a, a card. And I went to treatment in 1980 or 81. I went to a psychiatric center in um, Scottsdale, Arizona. And my observance when I first got there was that, you know, there was a woman, you know, turning doorknobs and there were people with mental uh, problems. And we were in group one day and I thought, these people are crazy. Mm. And then I thought, I'm in the group. So what are they thinking about me? Uh, and, and so my first treatment experience, the only thing I got out of it was I had my nose repaired, or, or I so thought I did. They, they cut in, they had a big sore scab uh, in my nose and I uh, went to surgery and he, he allegedly put it together. But what he did wrong was he pulled the stitch out 
the wrong side uh, when I went to post-op. But the, the insanity of me being in a treatment center in Arizona was that the doctor had a little, you know, tube of, of stuff. I stole it. He left the room, I, I stole it. And it was liquid cocaine. So crazy, crazy, crazy. I just, um, but go ahead. Well, no, that's okay. I, I, had, um, I had interrupted you before and you were making the point that you escalated after Tom Landry fired you because that was a major traumatic upset in your life. I mean, football was what you knew at that point. Um, so you, you escalated then and then where, what happened? So you went to treatment that was after that you were fired, right? Yes. Okay. So what happened after you did the treatment? Uh, Bill Walsh called me from the 49ers and invited me to join the 49ers. Um, I went out to, you know, OJ Simpson was on the team with us at that time. Uh, Joe Montana was a young kid and, and, and I was a pro bowler. And so, and so between me and OJ and, and it was a young team. Uh, but again, I, I had my wife and my daughter in Redwood city and everything was going really well. I was playing well. And then I found out a connection for cocaine up in Oakland. So I started running between Redwood City and Oakland to get uh, cocaine. And Walsh, uh, somebody snitched on me, I'm sure of it. But he, 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 he looked at me laying in my locker completely, you know, cloud nine. He witnessed this addict, Thomas Henderson, laying on the floor in my locker room. So he let me go. I mean, I, the next morning, there was a guy at my house with my shoulder pads and my, my shoes and, and, and would know, they just said, we don't want you back at the facility. Wow. And, and but then the phone rang. And here's the Houston Oilers says, hey, come on down to Houston. Now, you have to, <laughs> this is 1980. Right. I have, I don't know where I lived in Houston. I know we had a house, but Houston is a blur uh, because I, you know, I found lots of cocaine. Still not drinking, still not drinking yet. <laughs> Uh, but so I finished the 1980 season with the with the Houston Oilers, and of course I think it was after the Houston Oilers that I went to that treatment center. So to get my story in chronological. Okay. Um, so. Um, Thomas, did your wife know what was going on with you? Yeah, but I was, you know, I, I was like a runaway slave. I, you know, I, you know, I was hiding behind trees and. And you know, I you know, I, you know. Okay, that's quite an analogy. I just have to say that. But I'm black. you could, I can you say could that. disguise. Yeah, I know you can, but you could disguise it. In other words, you were, as they say, a functioning addict to some degree. Yeah, I was just you know not there. I was not there emotionally. I wasn't there physically. Um, I was fully engulfed in addiction. Um, I look back at it. It's mad. It's mm -hmm. nuts. It's crazy. Um, but you can't see and, it when you're in the middle of it, right? And, yeah, you can't see it. And so the Houston Oilers just didn't say, they didn't invite me back. They didn't sign me. You know, it's like I was just uh, loose, very loose cannon. Um, and then Don Shula called. Now, this is 1981. You know, the worst zip code for a drug addict is Miami, Florida. And so Don Shula signed me in 1981 for a lot of money. And so I went to Houston. I mean, went to Miami. I tried to 
keep it straight. You know, I had some idea about, okay, you can't do so much. You know, don't smoke it, just snort it. Um, and I was playing terrific football. You know, God had blessed me with this great body, this great strength, this great speed. And I basically just burned it down. So I broke my neck. The last preseason game of 1981. Wow. And I broke C1, which I'm lucky to be standing, speaking, and I still have a burst at C1 in the top of my head. Uh -huh. And so, you know, with a, with a, they put a body cast on me around my head, you know, it was like I had a vest and, you know, my arm sticking out. And so I was like this for, you know, like three months. Um, but again, while in a, a cast, I'm smoking crack. Wow. Were I'm you doing painkillers too? Did they give you any kind of painkillers? I am so grateful that I never really paid attention to or used any opioids in my day. I'm a, I'm a crackhead alcoholic. Okay. So, so the Dolphins paid me like $125,000 and I smoked it all. Mm. And I, I, I was back in Texas and I decided to go to California. And Ben Agajanian was the field goal kicker coach for the Dallas Cowboys. He was also one of those guys that had the, the half a foot, his foot was, and he wore a special, but he was nice enough to actually get me an apartment, uh, give me a job uh, as a, a foreman for a construction crew. And um, I just don't know where anything was at that time. It, if I try to tell you this, I don't know where my money was. I don't know where it was coming from. I had no idea what was going on. I really can tell you in, in, in all honesty, um, 1982 and 1983, I, you know, I can, you know, I, I know by documents where I was, but, but this is imperative that I tell you this. So, so Thomas Henderson, living in an apartment in Long Beach, California, uh, smoking. Now Thomas is smoking his crack with 151 rum because 151 rum is flammable. And so I'm lighting my Coke with 151. I am spending all my assets uh, pawning my Super Bowl rings, just nuts. So now I buy a, a pint, a, 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 a tall bottle of 151 rum. And so now I'm, I'm sipping on the rum because I know that that awful time is coming is when I run out of cocaine and I want to go to sleep and I don't want to be tripping or, or, or seeing things or hearing things. So I started drinking the 151 rum. And now Thomas Henderson's life is blackouts. Where you walk, you talk, you drive, you run, you, you do it, but you don't remember any of it. And, and so at this phase of my addiction, um, I'm smoking as much cocaine as I can get. I am killing the, 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 the court, not a court, it's probably a pint, a, a pint of, of 151 rum daily. So now this guy who doesn't drink is drinking. This guy that doesn't like alcohol at all, really, in this teetotaling little guy who drinks Coors <laughs> is drinking a flammable alcohol, flammable. 
You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com, or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com, or call us at 727 314 Seven zero eight zero, And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. For more information on our sponsor, Narconon Ojai, visit their website at narcononojai.org. That's N-A-R-C-O-N-O-N-O-J-A-I dot org. Or call 1-866-231-5924. That's 1-866-231-5924. Sometimes, the hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 1-833-918-0008 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. And so on November 2nd, 1983, uh, there was a knock on my door by the police. And the police said, uh, you assaulted someone and you sexually assaulted someone. I have no idea. Mm. I have, have it's been 37 years. I still don't know what Thomas Henderson did. I'm just glad that nobody died or anything, but uh, so, so, in a nutshell, what I'm saying to you, so you got a um, you got an athlete that's one of the best in the world, um, and he really doesn't want to drink because he doesn't like the taste. And but then he does all of those things that he didn't like to do uh, because he was an addict. Right. Um, and so Thomas Henderson is an alcoholic and an addict. And if, if I can make amends for the things that I did or didn't do or shit, I don't remember I did, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, so the cops arrived at your door and then what happened after that? I asked him, you must have the wrong... I don't, what are you talking about? And then did you, did you, did you go to jail? I did. Okay. And I put up my Super Bowl ring and got out again. And, um, oh, let's test, tell this story. So I get out of, out of jail and I go to treatment. I meet a great man named Dr. Joseph Persh. And he had treated Betty Ford and Billy Carter and others. And um, I started hearing the stuff of the 12 steps. And I saw men who had changed their life. And, and in that six months between getting arrested and being sentenced to prison, I became a member of, of a fellowship that is uh, paramount in my life today. Um, um, I stayed in treatment for six months. Well, but, but, and so while I'm in treatment, I know that I'm, I plea bar, I just said, I don't know what happened. I can't defend myself. And, you know, when you start telling, if you try to tell somebody straight about blackouts, they have, they, they have no idea what you're talking about. They think it's an excuse. You know, I'm 67 years old. I've been accused of assault once in 67 years. 
And I'm not a bad looking guy and I've known some beautiful women in my life, but so, so I don't have no pattern of, of that. So, but it was so, what happened to me was so embarrassing and, and just God awful that I either had to put a, a bullet in my head or get sober. And I'm glad I chose to get sober. I am too. We would say on the podcast that that was your point of no return. It's either get better, yes. take responsibility for my life or die. And yes. I'm, you made the right decision, obviously, because you're here today. So, yeah. so on June 11th, uh, on my sister's birthday, uh, 1984, I went to the California Department of Corrections for 28 months. And not to kid anybody, prison is awful. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on, gangs and, you know, but, you know, I'm a linebacker. So I, I, I wasn't scared of nobody, you know. <laughs> so I uh, had one or two fights and won both and people left me alone. But I have to tell you this. So I'm, I'm at church one Sunday at the men's colony in San Luis Obispo, California. And a guy next to me who lived on the same, one of the same tiers with me, he says, you see, see that guy over there? I go, yeah. He said, that's, that's Charles Tex Watson. I go, so I really am in prison. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been in these halfway houses. I've been in treatment. But, you know, if you're sitting next to Charles Tex Watson, your ass is really in prison. And it right. was just one of those days where I had a moment of, of clarity and 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 I was grateful that I was a sober member of our society. Um, so I did 28 months. Um, I got out and, and you know I, I got married. Um, but Thomas, those 28 months, from what I read, you used those 28 months to read, to study, to get closer to God, like. I interviewed a woman who had to go to prison because of a drug related crime. And she said, I approached prison at a, you know, like at a run and she did every college course she could do. And she, she used it to better herself. And from what I read about you, you did the same thing for those 28 months. You didn't let them go to waste. Okay. You got in a couple of fights. I get that, but you didn't, yeah. you didn't let them go to waste. And I think I th it's commendable. Well, um, you know, I read uh, everything. I mean, I read, if I was in the, I, I, I can't read today. I can't read today because I think I filled up my reading quota. <laughs> I read this book called Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. It's like a thousand pages. And, and when it was all said and done, that was what I considered friendship that no matter what, that I'm gonna do what I said I'm gonna do for a friend. And the, it made me cry. And so I, I, I read everything, you know, the, the big book, the Bible, the little book, the, the other book, I, I just read, ate, I ate everything. You know, Roger Starbuck, one of my teammates was so generous with me. I mean, he'd send me you know, I started a cigarette business in there, you know, you loan a pack out, you get two back. And and so I was the cigarette man on my yard. Um, um, so, oh, oh, but but while, while in there, I actually taught school. I didn't, really? have, I didn't have to work because of the C1 fracture uh, that I was completely and 100% disabled. So that this, the Department of Correction of California couldn't make me work. Right. The way they use labor in prisons is if if you work, you know, in the kitchen, the yard, or wherever, you get a day, you get a good day and a good day. You get two days, so you do half your sentence okay. if you work. Well, they wanted to put me in the kitchen, which was I, I didn't feel insulted because I have a college education. I didn't feel insulted, but I felt like a prisoner for a moment. And I looked at him and I says, well, 
I'm 100% disabled. I broke C1 in the NFL. If I fall in your kitchen, you got problems. And so they just let me do whatever I wanted. So I taught school. I taught elementary school to grown men. And it was one of the most rewarding episodes of, of my life. You know, that's, first of all, it's awesome that you did that. And thank you for everything you did there. But, you know, we, uh, years ago, we had a friend who was um, going into prisons with some program. And he said, one for one, the wardens told him that the hardcore criminals that were in the prison did not know how to read. And that, that correlation is not coincidence. So the fact that you were in there teaching these guys basically how to read, I think that's amazing. Well, you know, to, to watch a guy write his first letter now, you know, prison is not a place where you get emotional, but I'm in class just, you know, just crying. Uh, Cause he wrote his mom a letter and she wrote him back. And, oh. and, and, and so, yeah, there was. You some... changed the lives of those people. I mean, I, you I know, have... one-on-one, -on -one. I mean, being an NFL star, like you were huge. Okay. But, but doing what you were doing there in prison and impacting the lives of those men to where they'll never be the same again. Okay. I think that's pretty big too. Well, I was up in the, uh, part of my deal was they, I think all the wardens wanted me, you know, so I got the tour of <laughs> California. I went through Folsom on a bus and, but this is, this is important. In the upper state of California, where the, the fires are, I trained those firefighters in the prisons up in the Northern California. And so I found joy in running and training and, and push-ups and setups and stair-stepping and running again and running. And uh, I didn't want to go fight fires, but I sent firefighters who were in top condition to go up and down hills in California. Uh, I'm sure today they're probably too old to do that, but uh, from, from like, 84 and 85, I trained firefighters for the California Department of Corrections. I had no idea. I, I, I read a lot about you, um, but that is one that I didn't read anything about. And that, you know, again, you changed the lives of those men. Who knows how many of them are yeah, alive think, today because of how they, you trained them? I think they, I think they bless my life. Absolutely. Uh, to be frank with you, because and you bless I'm, theirs both. I met I met real killers and murderers and men who killed their wife and their child. I, I'm in my next door neighbor, but the nicest guy you ever want to meet, blacked out on on gin. He finally talked to me about drinking. He wouldn't come to an AA meeting, but he would talk to me about drinking and how he would days and beyond days would go by that he didn't remember what he had done. Yeah. So, so I get out in uh, 1986 and me and my wife were living in Costa Mesa, California and for a couple of years. And then I woke up one day and told, told my wife, I said, I got to go home. I got to go to tech. I got to go to Austin. I, I got to go home. I just have to go home. And my wife said, okay, but I'm not leaving my family to go to Texas with you. And I, I felt, uh, you know, I, I was, but I was, I had to go, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if you've ever had the urge to, that something says, your spirit says, go home. Yes. That's, was, that was the message. So I go home to Austin and I start making films for rehab centers and I started making films for prisons and uh, there, I got 13 titles now. Um, some of them are on YouTube, uh, a couple, well, one of them is, uh, uh, Yes, I'm Still Clean is on, uh, eight, it's eight parts, 10 parts, I don't know. Um, so I'm in Austin uh, from 1989 to 2011 years, I built this big business of selling films, industrial films to prisons, and et cetera. And then one day I bought a lottery ticket and I won $28 million. I, I just think that's amazing. 
<laughs> yeah. And, um, and so 20 years later, you know, I'm still doing very well. My children are well. My, my family is well. Uh, my recovery is well. Because if I'm not sober, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm something bad is going to happen. And so I am grateful to God, as I understand him today, that whatever you think about me, that's fine. Um, mistakes, I made a few. Uh, too many to mention. But I can look you straight in the eye today and say that my life is blessed. I'm clean and sober uh, for nearly 37 years. My daughters love me. My grandchildren love me. My friends love me. My enemies love me. I, I, hear, from, I hear from people who I know don't really like me because uh, they like what I have. I, I mean, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm probably working with about 100 men um, who call me for advice and counsel and and some knuckle, some real knuckleheads too <laughs> um, that that listen to what I have to say. So um, I just want to say to you, very very well done on your sobriety and where you are today. I I just have to kind of interrupt you to say that. And the fact that you're helping others, that's what's so huge. And that's what's so needed in this whole area of addiction. Now, let me ask you a question. If somebody that was listening wanted to reach out to you, how would they do that? They can find me easy on Facebook. Okay. Do you go by Thomas Henderson? Thomas, no, Thomas Henderson. Okay. And, and for those, anybody listening right now, there's, there's three things I want you to understand. There's, there's your story, there's my story, and then there's our story. And our story is being discussed in rooms, very private rooms all over the United States, all over the world. They're called the 12 step meetings. I'm not gonna name one or the other because people go to them for gambling, for sex, for alcohol, for drugs, for crack, for heroin, opioids, whatever your deal is. And so, okay, remember that, that there's your story, there's my story, and then there's our story. If, if you will take time to really understand our story, there may be help for you because there's a community of us on this planet Earth who can't drink a drug. We shouldn't drink a drug. Right. Um, and so that would be my big statement. I, th I think that's huge. And I, you also made a point in one of the videos that I watched, and that is that you have to want it for yourself to get better. It doesn't matter if your wife wants it, your husband wants it, your mom and dad, your brother, you have to want it for yourself. And I think you have to know that you deserve it and you're valuable enough to get that help. And anyway, I'm taking those words out of your mouth because you said them well, on a video, but it's a, it's a very, I think it's a very important point. Well, let's, let's just take it back to your, your first drink or your first joint or your first anything. And then, you know, look where you are. And you can, you can reverse that. I mean, you're not going to clean up the whole table, but you, you'll live a much better life if you think about staying clean and sober one day at a time. That's all, you know, 24 hours is, is powerful. And today I woke up because they say this lady was gonna interview me on this show. And I go, all I gotta do is tell her the damn truth. And it's gonna be a great day. <laughs> Thomas, I cannot thank you enough for being willing to share your story. You know, I, your story resonated with me and I know it's going to resonate with the people listening. It's obviously resonated with all of the people that you've helped. And I, I sincerely, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. And I have to tell you one, one story before we go. So 
it's um, it's 80, 89 or nineteen ninety, and I've been friends with Richard Pryor for fifteen years, and I'm working at a treatment center called Sierra Tucson in in Tucson, Arizona, and I speak there once a month uh, to the patients. And I've seen celebrities in there that I can't name, but Richard was a friend of mine. And so they were so tight about anonymity that they didn't even tell me that Richard Pryor was there. Mm. So I walk out on stage and in a aisle, see, he had a wheelchair because of the problems he had at the very end. He's sitting in a wheelchair. And I walk out and it just, it stunned me. It's like, oh shit. Oh, that's Richard Pryor. You know, stand up comedian of all time, Richard, and my friend, I love him. And I made Richard Pryor laugh for an hour. There's nothing better than that in my entire life is to have Richard Pryor hitting his wheelchair arm thing going, that's funny, that's funny, that's funny. <laughs> I love that, I love that. But, you know, there is there is some joy on the backside. Absolutely, absolutely. And I feel nothing but joy from you. And yeah. again, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the interview today. I thought it was absolutely fascinating. I think Thomas Hollywood Henderson's story is quite an amazing one. And, you know, we've talked many, many times about how addiction doesn't just affect the dirty homeless man under the bridge. It can affect anybody. And this is quite the story, I think, not only of someone who is at the top and then reached the bottom through addiction, but who is helping other people and that's what's most important once again he said you can reach him on his facebook um on facebook is thomas henderson and also i wrote down the name of the video he said that he has on youtube that you might want to watch called yes i'm still clean so thank you again for watching and listening today if you or someone that you know needs help please do it now. Don't wait, especially with this whole COVID-19. It's more dangerous than ever for people who are addicted. So please get yourself, get your friends, your loved ones into treatment. And we'll talk again next week. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return, sponsored by Narconon Ojai. For more information on Narconon Ojai, call 866-231-5924 or visit www.narcononojai.org. Narconon is a non-12-step rehabilitation program based on the works of L. Ron Hubbard.